first, thank you for organizing. Um, thank you for organizing in such a way that it will be a lot easier for me. Um, a lot of the ABCs have been answered. Wetlands have been introduced. Um, the gap being nanomaterials in wetlands in its entirety already identified. Um, <clears throat> so I think this will be quite interesting. My objective here is to generally describe the project. It's quite a large, encompassing project. I'm going to focus on the wetland park for as long as I can. And I'm hoping that will just will spur on discussion. And I'm really looking forward to the dinner tonight. I think there's going to be a lot of advice, hopefully, um, brought this way from many people in the room. Um, <clears throat> with that, I'll start. So the, the title, Ecotoxicity and Transport of Nanoparticles Released from Commercial Products, that's the title of the project of the grant. Specifically today, I'm going to talk about just project description and preliminary results. There's not too many to discuss. Um, I am from Canada, Royal Military College of Canada, the word royal there being uh, quite important, being in the UK. Um, <clears throat> this is a general pictorial understanding of our, our project, commercial products, release, transport, transformation, and impacts. And we've all been talking about that today in, in some form. So it's a three-year grant. It started in January, so we're not that far in. Um, <clears throat> it's funded by NSERC. I need to put that, especially if it's on video. Um, we have partners being Environment Canada and Golder Associates. So what does that mean? That means we have regulators and we have practitioners, so consultants, environmental consultants. So we're really getting input and drivers from many different aspects, from different uh, angles. I'm just going to go through the conceptual um, diagram of the pathways that we think about more so in Canada. There are others than this. Obviously, I completely ignore air, as we all have today. But <clears throat> in general, you have commercial products. You have wear leaching, some kind of release, perhaps going into the stormwater in some cases, perhaps going to wastewater treatment. This is part of the project, trying to look at that release. <coughs> You would also have disposal in landfills, and that um, pathway is being ignored um, to a large degree in this project. Just to get a little bit more busy, um, we then want to look at release um, in the landfill, um, transport specifically, but also looking at ecotoxicity specifically with application of biosolids to soil. So in Canada, um, many people discussed it's found in the sludge. It, it, it accumulates there. In Canada, we spread about 50% of our biosolids onto soil. It's quite a bit. <clears throat> There's obviously some discharge from stormwater and wastewater treatment, but just to come over here, looking at this, this release, and then the subsurface transport. We had a, a presentation on subsurface transport. We will be, we are actually have done quite a bit of work there. And then you come down into the discharge and ecotoxicity to wetland ecosystems. So that's the generality. We're not touching everything, but there are a few points that we are pulling out. I'm going to focus more down here for this presentation, but I'll touch on some of the other aspects being tackled. This is a, just a general concept that you know, I, I, I like to present. Um, I would say, personally, I feel that when you discuss pristine nanoparticles, so either synthesized in the lab or purchased off the shelf, and looking at single organism testing, I'd say we have some pretty good data these days. I'd say we have enough data that has shown us that we need to look into it a little bit more detail, which is why we're coming at it from this perspective, commercial products, we're not dealing with pristine, and we've all discussed that in the room, they can look like big messes as we see down on the left. And now we should also be thinking about ecotoxicity. Larger ecosystems, many different components, synergy, what does that mean? Um, cycling. So <clears throat> that's some of the generalities from the project. Specific to today in this talk, treating the wetland scenario. Here's another scenario that I don't think was really discussed. Talking about single homes, so take Denmark for example, 
I've been told um, by Hans and Carlos that there's over 10,000 single home systems in Denmark. It's a lot. So, active person, likes to run, likes to wear the non-order of clothing. Obviously, you put your clothing in the wash. Silver nanoparticles released from that odor resistant clothing into the water. And then we go into the wetland. So, these wetlands were never designed to handle nanoparticles. They're designed to take, you know, organics, hopefully take some nitrogen, maybe touch phosphorus a little bit. Well, if these things are toxic to microorganisms, silver nanoparticles, for example, and this thing is largely microbial based, I believe Vincent told us that, well, what does that mean for water quality in the end? Not just the system itself, how it's going to last, or ecotoxicity to plants or microbes, but they're the guys doing the job of water treatment. So what does that mean in the end here? So that's the concept, <clears throat> one of the concepts, and the one I think we'll just keep in context today for me. <clears throat> and just to mention, I, I did remove all of my background, my beautiful backgrounds, everything I had to to get it to run. So things look a little bit strange sometimes. Um, in this case, I just want to show some approaches that, that I've taken to treatment wetlands. Two different ways, obviously, in situ and ex situ. In situ, I think most people in the room know that I'm a very microbially focused guy. Um, <clears throat> and I do a lot of mesocosm work. So, you know, you can, you can take a look at microbial community activity or function, for example, in a system. You can add some kind of contaminant or, or, or pharmaceutical or nanoparticle, and you can see what happens in situ. You can also do this kind of thing ex situ as well. And I just want to point out one of these methods that, we, that I've developed and we're using. Um, it's an ex situ method where we have these plates. You're looking at microbial activity from a wetland system, for example, in 96 different wells. These different wells have different carbon sources, different nutrient sources, this type of thing. So what we're trying to do is, in each plate, you add a different concentration of whatever contaminant you're looking at. Silver nanoparticles will be the focus of this, this uh, talk and discussion. And, well, let's have a look at, essentially, a dose response type curve. So I just want to present that, because I'm going to show a little bit of ex situ data, because that's what I have to show you. We haven't been through our in situs yet. Not enough time. So again, project description, fate and toxicity, yes. Nanoparticles that are written into this, this project, silver, titanium dioxide, carbon nanotubes. And I don't know if many people are familiar with this one, nanocrystalline cellulose. Hands for anyone who's heard of it? OK, maybe 25% of the room. For Canada, it's quite an important one because we're developing this as hopefully a commercial product um, from the pulp and paper industry. So for Canada, it's quite, um, quite interesting. Um, I'm not going to get into it too much. I'm going to focus on silver. And the reason I'm going to focus on silver is because the group has decided to focus on silver first. Get our methods in place, um, see what we get. Before we move into, I wouldn't suggest this is more complicated, but certainly these ones would be. So we have four specific objectives. As I mentioned, there's release, there's transport, there's transformation impacts, essentially assess the ecotoxicity and fate of selected ENPs, engineered nanoparticles and soils, and looking at it in wetland systems as well. So those are the four objectives. I'm just going to focus on um, D. Here's some of the people involved. Um, Lars is officially um, on the grant. Um, <clears throat> we have Julissa Prince from Environment Canada Scientists. We have a regulator. Um, we have Elijah Peterson from NIST in the US. Um, and we have some Golder people as well. And obviously myself and Dennis O'Carroll from University of Western Ontario. He's a transport guy. Um, we have a number of people. Unfortunately, Mark couldn't be here. Um, Mark helped put this presentation together and he deserves a lot of, um, um, he deserves note for sure, mention here. 
Um, so we have students working on these different aspects. They haven't been at it too long. I'm just going to touch on a few things. So looking at different products, we're focusing right now on fabrics. There has been work done on it in this area, certainly. There's a reason we want to do this, though. Rather than just characterize the nanoparticles that come off, the transformation. So if you think about a washing machine kind of scenario, well, you can look at the different detergents, you could look at different temperatures of wash, these types of things, and what we're finding is, yes, it does affect the nanoparticles you get off. Um, certainly in size, but also speciation. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's just some, some examples. Um, you know, we have been looking at, at different socks. This is a bit of a lesson learned that I wanted to pass on to the group here. There's a type of sock that has ecstatic uh, nylon in it. Anyone who's worked with silver nanoparticles know that these ecstatic uh, nylon is supposed to have a lot of silver. A whole heck of a lot of silver. And there's some great um, literature showing that it has a lot of silver. What we found, though, is the new ecstatic socks were not really able to get a lot of silver out of it. Whether that's our digestion process not being able to extract it, and it's really bound on these fabrics, or whether they've taken the concentrations down since they were put in a bad light by many um, uh, literature studies. Not sure. Bit of a lesson learned. Maybe don't just trust what's been done in the literature four or five years ago. You probably need to do it again to see what kind of concentrations, what kind of particles you get off. So we're not seeing large concentrations like many others have. Bit of a lesson learned. Um, in terms of development of the characterization aspect of this project, and this is where I'm hoping to generate some ideas and some feedback. Um, we got this great Quanta FEG 250. Not sure if anyone in the room knows what that is, but it's essentially a STEM system, so a scanning transmission electron microscope. So, in fact, this one lets us take TEM images, but then lets us do focus in and get some EDACs on that, those specific areas as well from an SEM type system. We're also trying to develop wet stem. And I loved, I didn't hear much about wet stem from anybody um, yet, but this is a method where, as opposed to doing um, sample preparation on slides and possibly having transformations in that preparation, you can actually take your sample, direct injection on, into a wet stem um, type uh, vessel. We're just working this out because we did get the instrument six months ago. So it's, it's, it's a learning experience. But anyone that has wet STEM experience, I'd love to talk to you. I think there's some, some great possibilities with it. Um, so some simple images on that one. We're obviously looking to use some complementary methodology. Sorry, Lars, it's three in this case. <laughs> um, so we are looking at single particle ICPMS. However, in our case, we're only able to get out of 30 nanometers with the detection that we have on our instrumentation. It's a little older. Um, and DLS as well in terms of size. Objective B, I'm just going to touch on it. We are doing significant transport work. Um, you just saw some breakthrough curves in a previous presentation. Uh, we're looking at many different aspects of transport is probably the part of the project that has moved furthest so far. Soil, again, I'm not going to try and, and, and focus on it, but I, I, I am hoping to have some conversation with colleagues afterwards. But really, we do want to do two things. We want to assess the effects of EMPs released from commercial products on soil, and we want to perform a screening study um, release from commercial products on microbial communities from soils across Canada. So this is more of a general, um, smaller scale, and the other is kind of a screening study. So in detail, in situ type studies, less detail, detail ex situ scanning, screening type study. Um, <clears throat> some of the methods we're using here, you know, if you if you expose a soil to to a nanoparticle. There's many things that can happen. There's many things that are important to soil health. Um, specifically, you think about crop viability, 
um, or just ability to um, hold um, biota like plant plants, for example. So a number of different things we're looking at. They kind of get more more uh, difficult as as you come down a long list there, um, and I'd, I'd love to talk to you a little bit later on that. This is essentially a list of methodology that's being developed in Canada as a soil health suite. So as opposed to looking at single organisms like a worm or something like this, trying to take a broader approach. Look at the actual soil health. <coughs> We've looked at a few studies to date, um, a number of them being close to the institution which I'm at, but some of them being um, a little bit farther across Canada. And here's some preliminary results. If you remember the ex situ methodology I was telling you about, where we can, we can create some dose response curves. Well, the response here is microbial activity. Um, this stands for average well color development, specific um, terminology for the type of um, plate we were using. Um, a few interesting things you can see here. I'm just showing. Um, a high organic matter soil and a low organic matter soil. So the high being blue, the low organic matter soil being red, and a few different um, coatings. So CMC coated, have your ionic form, AVP coated, and then uncoated. Quite, quite interesting results. Um, we have looked at many other soils, but this general trend seems to be holding for us. A little bit unexpected, and that the lower organic matter soil seems to be holding up a little bit better. Interesting. Objective D. So, you know, hopefully take the next four or five minutes to discuss this. Two minutes? Oh, geez. Okay. <laughs> um, here's our greenhouse. So, if we talk about mesocosm systems, setting them up in, in, a, in a way that's, that's appropriate. We have a nice greenhouse here that's temperature controlled and humidity controlled. So we get a pretty consistent um, area. The systems that we're, that we're looking to use are on total recycle. So this is a nice, nice um, rendering of the systems themselves. They're made of clear PVC and they have a pump and we're able to circulate. I'll just show a picture of one operation. So we're circulating below the surface. Okay, so we're, we actually have a very low DO, low redox um, type system. When we circulate like this, we then have aerators in some of the other systems. So really looking at that treatment wetland um, scenario, the new aeration system, um, intensified design being uh, something of interest to people. We have little jackets for them because we want to, um, we don't want the photos to um, be able to develop in these systems. So there you can see some of the systems. Um, they're not up and running yet, but they are built. And here's our experimental design. So Monarchy might be quite interested in what we're doing here is a triplicated two to the three factorial in that we have 12 non-aerated, 12 aerated, then we have 12 unplanted, 12 planted, 12 that are going to be exposed to the nanoparticles, and 12 that will be left as controls. The reason we have controls, well, environmental variation can actually affect some of the things we're going to be looking at. Some of the things we're going to be looking at, we have a number of different metrics. We have hydrological properties we want to look at. We want to look at porosity, evapotranspiration, dispersivity in these systems over time. We want to look at plants, obviously. And we can actually, I should have added root development here because we have these clear PVC systems. Take the jacket off and get an actual visualization of root development. Water treatment efficiency. So remember the, the original idea being how do these pharmaceuticals, these nanoparticles, affect the actual system doing the job it was meant to do? We want to look at that as well. And obviously some microbial properties because it's the love of my life. Um, doing some in situ overall activity, FDA tests, and then some more um, directed structural and functional um, assays as well. And of course, 
one of the great things about this, it is on total recycle. So we add a simulated wastewater, put it in, we let it recycle for as long as the retention time is that you want to look at. Say it's seven days. Okay? Circulate for seven days. The nice thing about this is it's all sealed. And we have sampling ports. So what we're hoping to be able to do is to watch this thing moving essentially through a wetland unit and be able to take out some water samples over time. Watch that transformation. Watch the agglomeration. Maybe model it even. Get a K rate of some sort. So those are the ideas. And here's just an example. This is data where I, I hit a mesocosm with ciprofloxacin and looked at the same type of thing, but that's the type of data we're hoping to collect just with this nanoparticle exposure. And some really quick um, preliminary data. Again, a constructed wetland, a natural wetland. Constructed wetlands actually seem to be holding up a little bit better under the different exposures ex situ that we're looking at. Interesting result, very preliminary. And again, we have no in situ data to show right now. That's it. I'm sorry I was a little over Lars. No problem. Thank you.